welcome friends and family to honor the life of a great person, a big man with a big heart, who's very dear to his children, his grandchildren, his great-grandchildren, a very beloved husband and sibling and friend of many people. So today we tell stories about his life. We share about all the good things he did for us, all the things that he left us, all the things that he taught us. We have a few smiles and a few laughs too because that's what have, would have been something he would have wanted for us as well. So we start with a selection from the Psalms. We start with the familiar 23rd Psalm. You're welcome to, to say along with me in the English if you wish. We first start with the Hebrew. Mizmer le David, Adenoi roi lo exar, Bina yisteshech yarbitzeni, Almei menuchos yinachaleni, Nafshi eshovev yancheni vemagli tzedek leman shemo. Gam ki elach begeit somavis, lo ira ra ki ata imadi. Shiftacha o mishantecha, hema yenachamuni. Tarach lefanai sholchan, neged sarai. Dishante v'shem en roshi, kosi revaya. Achtov v'chesed yir defuni, kol yamei chayai. V'shavte v'beis adenoi, v'orech yamim. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in right paths for his namesake. Thy walk in the valley of the shadow of death. I shall fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou hast set before me a table in the presence of mine enemies. Thou hast anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We also say Psalm 130. Shir Hamalos mi mamakim kerasicha adinoi. Adinoi shema vakoli, tianaz nacha kushuvos, la kol tachanunoi. Im avonois tishmar ya, adinoi mi hamod. Ki imcha haslicha, le man tivere. Ki visi adinoi, ke visa nashi, velid vero ho choti. Nashi la adinoi, me shamrim la boker, shamrim la boker. Yachel Yisrael el Adinoi, ki im Adinoi achesed v'harbei imo fedus. V'hu yifdei is Yisrael mikol avonaisav. A song of ascents, from the depths I called you, O Lord. My Lord, hear my voice. May your ears be attentive to the sound of my pleas. If you preserve iniquities, O God, who could survive? For with you is forgiveness, that you may be feared. I put confidence in God, my soul puts confidence, and I hope for his word. I yearn for my Lord among those longing for the dawn, those longing for the dawn. Let Israel hope for God, for with God is kindness, and with him is abundant redemption. And he shall redeem all of Israel from all of their difficulties. So myself and a lot of the people who work at Montefiore, Montefiore have had a nice long relationship with these guys, with this family. And they're, they're definitely one of our fans, our support group. Even when we're not so perfect, they always tell us how meaningful and appreciative they are of all of us. And so it's such a pleasure and such an such a, you know, important thing to me and to all the people I work with to be able to be here in this fashion, to be able to give words of, of honor and respect to your, your dear father and grandfather. <coughs> so from sitting down with the kids, you know, I got some good stories. And I was able to put together, I hope, you know, a, a nice description of the life that Dad went through and some of the ideas that he believed in and some of the reasons he was as he was. You know, because some of the things he did and said were pretty routine, you know, pretty much expected, but some were not so routine. So we wouldn't mind knowing where those came from and where did he get them from. And if I may say a little bit of a, a quirkish thing is that his kids also have some of the, the cute characteristics of dad and, and, of, and, and of mom. And you also, also would help to know where they came from as well. You know, they've, also, they've also got you know, a lot of cute personality things that we enjoy very much. But our beloved Don, or Donald to some people, might not have called him, he grew up in the 105th Street neighborhood, the Glenville neighborhood, which was a very, very busy, happening Jewish neighborhood full of stores, places to go, lots of things for a young kid, a young boy like himself, to get involved with, to do good, and to get into a little bit of trouble with. The family lived in Pearl Avenue, and his parents were Saul and Ida Lewis. 
and his sister, of blessed memory, Marsha. It was not an easy life for them. You know, they, they, all, they all struggled in different ways. His father, you know, worked with tires, worked with cars, worked with different things, but there seldom was ever enough money to be able to put food on the table adequately. So much so that Don and Marsha actually had to live with other family members for quite some time when they were young, just because there was no food to feed them. And many of us think about working, you know, when we're 18, maybe when we're 16, we, you know, get a light job, help out a little bit with some money at the family. But when it came to Don's life at age 11, he had to take on a pretty serious job, you know, and he had a serious responsibility in making money for the family. And already at age 11, he was driving cars and trucks. He was doing things that many people would not even think about until they were much older. And he very much didn't really have a childhood. He had to immediately jump to being a hardworking, serious guy with expectations upon him. And there was no time just to play ball, hang out with friends. It was really work. And this probably had a lot to do with why he always had such a good work ethic. He was always such a devoted worker later in his life. And this made him tough. This made him a tough guy who didn't mess around. And of course, he was no small guy. He was of pretty big stature. And it was, I kind of laughed a little bit because his Hebrew name is Shimshon, which of course is Samson. You know, and Samson is regarded as one of the biggest guys in the, in the Bible. You know, as his muscles and his size can break down a whole building. So I don't know how his parents knew that he would be a little bit bigger than, than, than normal when they named him at his birth. So he worked and worked, and he eventually entered the Western Reserve and began a course of study in engineering. But he could not finish his course of study. In those days, there wasn't a deferment that said you were in school and you didn't have to go fight. And he was drafted, and he fought in the Korean War. And he was sent to Europe. He was sent to Germany, where he served some time there. But already at age 16, before the war had even started, he knew this young lady named Shirley Turk. But at the time, she wasn't so impressed by him. He was a little rough around the edges. He was a little bit brutish at times, a little bit too tough. And she, she wasn't quite impressed by some of that toughness. But Don was truly swooned by her, and he was determined that he would win her over. He would impress her and her family. And as we know, he's a pretty charming guy. So with we'll give him a little bit of time, a little bit of effort, he was able to make it happen. So they were married, and before he went off to war, they became a couple. And they would have three kids in the span of his, his service time in just about four years. So Shirley was a very busy lady, needless to say. And even though they were, had different personalities, they, they kind of made it work for each other. Shirley was very good to him. She really took care of him and treated him like a prince in many ways. And they both had had tough childhoods. She was the child of a Holocaust survivor who didn't really have such a childhood, and neither did he. After the war, he came back, and he became the director of laboratories at a place called Alloys and Chemicals in the Flats. And he was, again, a very, very dedicated worker. And he would have been there for much longer, but the company got sold and had to close, so he was there for just about 20 years. And in those days, you didn't really have a degree that made you scientific, that made you good at what you did. A lot of it was just figuring things out on your own, you know, knowing, knowing things just because you know them, and that's exactly what he did. He never finished school, but he was an expert in many of these scientific areas of engineering that had to do with his job. Then he went to work for certified, certified alloys in Bedford, and he did that until he was age 60. And in fact, he would have stayed longer, but they just decided, okay, time to get rid of him. He's 60 years old already. And one of the things that was, that was kind of funny was that if you told a person today what his job was, you would tell like a, a young person, his job was in charge of pollution, you know, and um, safety. And you would immediately picture, you know, someone with, you know, an obsession of the environment and worried about how many fish he affected and, you know, any species of birds that were being affected by the production. And that person would have to make sure that the world we lived in was as green as possible. But when it came to Don, it was quite a different approach to safety and pollution because generally the best way to deal with the EPA in those days was you would take him out to lunch, you would pick a really good restaurant, you would serve them three martinis, and by the time they were done with lunch, there were no issues with those birds or the rivers or the, <laughs> the pollution in the factory. So I don't know if everyone quite did it the way that Don did it, but his immense people skills and his charisma 
you know, made those martinis, a very good approach to the problems. But besides being able to sweet talk the EPA guys and make things good for his company, he really, really was an expert in his field. He knew the field of metal, metallurgy, metallurgy very, very well, and he was a member of the American Society of that word. And he, <laughs> he traveled around the country, you know, and he was often called upon to examine very difficult situations. You know, factories had blast furnaces and die casting, and no one could figure out what was wrong about them. You know, why weren't they producing exactly like they were supposed to? And he could just get off the plane, check out the factory, and could see immediately what the matter was. He was such an expert in his field. And so on one hand, it was tough work. It was hot and dirty and dangerous. He didn't always get dirty, and he wasn't always in the dangerous part because he was smart, but it was, it was a tough work of sorts. And he was really a man's man when it came to a lot of things, when it came to the job, as we discussed in the martini lunches. But when he wasn't working, he was working at his softball game and his golf game. So almost, almost every single weekend, Saturday or Sunday, you know where he was. He was with the guys playing softball or golf, and he really loved that. And I think he wasn't a bad, he was a pretty good player of those games, but he was an excellent schmoozer. You know, the schmoozing that you could do during golf and softball was unprecedented. And so, <clears throat> and so that, that, was, that was what his, that's what he used to do. And because of this kind of schedule that he kept, he wasn't exactly an expert in raising his children. You know, I don't think he had seen a diaper. I don't think he had seen the inside of the oven, you know, except for rare times. Um, you know, and he was the kind of dad that was just, he had to do, he was very practical, did what he had to do, kind of a dad. A child of the Depression whose lesson to his children was you just got to work, and you got to work, and you got to work. But along the way, he was able to teach his kids a lot of solid lessons. You know, he taught his kids about business. And one of his most important lessons in life is to be a realist. If someone says to you, I have a great property to sell you, it's just perfect for you, it'll be so wonderful for you, you would probably get excited and say, ah, I should do this. This sounds really good. I'm sure this guy is very honest. But Don would say, wait a second. Why is he telling you that? Why does he want to sell you the property? Why doesn't he keep it? You know, he'd be always that word of, of real reality that we didn't always want to listen to. He'd always say that if the deal looks too good to be true, I'm sure it wasn't too good. And the funny thing about him is that he was always kind of teaching you what you needed to know all the time. You know, there are times when you did something a little bit stupid, a little bit silly, and he would tell you, of course, on the spot what you needed to work on, but he would remind you about it every so often. You know, he would just insert a little phrase, a little zinger when you least expect it, about the time that you forgot to do something you should have known better about, just to make sure that you don't lose hold of that lesson. But the real lesson that he gave was you got to be honest about yourself and your life. You know, you can't make things up. You got to be straight. And his kids were saying that, you know, even though life wasn't always simple and he wasn't always perfect in his role as a father, he always told it the way it was. You know, he had a correct and accurate vision of how things, you know, were in his world. So as the rabbi, I should probably talk about the Judaism piece. And he wasn't a big religious guy. You know, he was, it wasn't so important to him. He just barely got bar mitzvah is the way that I heard this story. But, but it was very important to his wife. You know, his wife was a, was a beautiful homemaker, surely loved to make the holiday meals, invite people, and make a big deal about them. And he was, he was happy to acquiesce. He was happy to be present at the table and to eat and to you know, make sure that it was nice for Shirley. But just because he wasn't so religious doesn't mean that he doesn't have a bigger connection to things. And for him, his family roots were very, very important. He felt very connected, and it was extremely important to him to be part of this wonderful family that he has from his, his own side and from his wife's side. And as he became older, his connections to his family became even more important. And one nice thing about him was that as he became older, he began to realize that he didn't have as much time with his children as he could have. And he tried his best to get closer to them and get to know them better. And Michael described a lot of golf that they played and you know what a great joy it was just going on the, the golf um, course with his father and his father seeing him play and him seeing his dad play and, and the two of them schmoozing and talking to the guys. You know, that, that was a great pleasure. And that I understand he even taught his daughters how to play golf too. So that was something that you guys definitely got from your dad. And that as he got older, he wanted to talk to his children. You know, he wanted to make up for things that he had missed. He wanted to hear about their lives and what it was like. 
And in fact, when he got older, he did express his emotions that he never talked about before to a certain extent. And he actually gave hugs. You know, he became a hugging type of a guy later in his life when I guess when he was younger, that was really never something that he was so interested in. And I think that the nice thing about him was that he wasn't just a little bit coming out of his shell, but his kids really gave him a chance to do that. They really encouraged him to be all that he could be. And I know Nancy had a big role in making sure that he was okay, that he, he had a lot of health issues at the end of his life. You know, he needed a lot of attention. You know, he had Crohn's, he had heart disease, he had lung issues, and he was a little bit stubborn, I guess, right? <laughs> so he definitely he needed a super full-time caregiver. And that was, you know, what you guys did, especially Nancy. And I know one of the outcomes of this caregiving job, which is a very hard job, was that he really, really came into saying thank you and I love you. And a lot of the time you would do a good deed for him, do something simple for him even, and he would say how much he thanks you and how much he loves you and how much he would appreciate it. And I think that as he got older, as he himself got sick, I came to learn that he, did be he understood better his own wife's illnesses. You know, Shirley had a lot of problems with her back and, and things like that. And maybe at the time he didn't really realize, you know, he wasn't as sensitive as he could have been. But when he got his own illnesses and realized how tough it can really be, you know, he became you know, very empathetic, very compassionate. But the main thing is despite this, these kind of uh, hugs coming out and this, you know, this side of him that we just discussed, he still was very much Shimshon, you know, he still was very much the Stamson personality, you know, very, very tough guy. You know, just because he had health issues, he was not willing to put down the pipe. And he smoked, and he smoked his pipe in particular until he was age 87, you know, so that's not bad. Um, <laughs> so, and a lot of the time I can picture his doctor saying to him, well, you just had a heart valve replacement. It's going to be a while until you could probably get back to your normal routine of things. But Michael knew it to the day, I think, that dad got up from his heart valve replacement. Six weeks later, he was on the golf course. <laughs> and that was when he was in his 80s. You know? and, and the kids got to see just how tough he really was. Not just he was stubborn tough, but you know, he had a lot of pain and he had a lot of suffering, but he didn't let that get to him in a big way. So he really was a big guy with a big heart. You know, he, he came around and he... And he also, became, he also was always very generous. He liked to give to his family. He took care of his, you know, his sister's family, his, his own family, his friends. And he was always happy to take people into his house, he and Shirley, to help them get back on their feet and find their way in life again. So there's, there's a lot more to see about him. But if I may say so, I think sometimes people do their own hard work and we admire them and we say it's how great what they did, you know, how, how far they have come in their own personal life. But to see, to see how a person has influenced his family, you know, as I said in the beginning, that a lot of the great traits that he has, his sense of humor and his charisma and his way of dealing with life, then when life throws you lemons, you make lemonade, a sense of toughness and not getting too upset or too angry or thrown off by life's challenges, you see this very much in his family. You know, and I think that in taking care of the, their family over the years, a couple times at Montefiore, we felt, ah, we made a mistake. We forgot something kind of important or something, ah, we didn't want to happen, happen. And for us, it was a big deal. But for them, it's like, ah, you know, whatever. <laughs> we, can, we can deal with it. You know, that's just how life goes. So I think that Don would be very proud of his children and his, you know, grandchild, grandchild and grand, great-grandchildren, you know, for all that they have accomplished. And they've definitely kept up with his soft, loving, big heart kind of a, guy personality. So we pray that his memory should be for a blessing and that we are glad that we can give him nachas and joy, you know, and good feelings with the, the family and the love that he has left behind. So, so in just a moment, we're going to be finishing up the chapel service. And before we rise for the final prayers, I wanted to share with you the arrangements for today, that following today's service in the chapel, we're going to go in the procession of vehicles to the Mount Olive Cemetery, and that's where the interment will take place in the Jewish War Veteran section of Mount Olive in the back. And then following the burial, um, the family will receive friends and family at the residence of his, his daughter Diane and her husband, Jeff McConnochcha, um, 363 Longspur Road in Highland Heights. And that will be today, Thursday, following services until 5 p.m. 
And if people want to wish to, would like to contribute, they don't have to. They could do so to the Maltz Hospice House, care of the Montefiore Foundation. So what we're going to do now is please rise. We're going to say the memorial prayer. And then we're actually going to say the Kaddish here in the chapel. And then after that, if you're able to, we can we'll remain standing. And then the pallbearers will come forth and we will escort you know, Don through the back of the chapel. And the custom is that the pallbearers come forward, they start moving the casket in that direction, the family goes behind the casket, and then the rest of us in the audience fall in behind them. So we're now going to say the memorial prayer, the theme of which is that God looks over our loved ones when they've passed away. When they go to heaven, when they go to the Garden of Eden, they are not alone, but instead very well loved and watched over. El male rachamim, shaychein vamrumim, hamse menucha nechaina, al kanfe hashchina, bemalos kedoshim utaharim, kazarakia mazhirim, es nishmas, shimshon ben shimen hakoyhein, shahalach loilamo, bavor shanachto mispalim behad haskaras nishmaso, began eden tehe menucha so, lachain bal harachamim, Yasti Rechel Besisa Kanaf of the Oilamim, be it Sorbet Sarachayim Es Nishma so, Adenai Hu Nachla so, be Yanoach al Mishkavo Beshalom, Benemar Amen. O God full of mercy, who dwells on high, grant proper rest on the wings of the Divine Presence, in the lofty levels of the holy and the pure ones, who shine like the glow of the firmament, for the soul of our most beloved Shimshon, the son of Sh of of Shimon, or, or our beloved Don Lewis, who has gone to his world, or for whom we pray. May his resting place be in the Garden of Eden, and may the Master of Mercy shelter him in the shelter of his wings for all eternity, and may he bind his soul in the bonds of life. God is his heritage, and may he repose in peace on his resting place, and we say together, Amen. So we stay standing for just a moment as we ask the family.